ever feel like woof, juggling a million things at once, mm -hmm. trying to make good decisions, be a good person, all while you know the world keeps throwing curse balls your way. Yeah. Now imagine doing all that while running an empire. Oh wow! Literally, that's the life of Marcus Aurelius, Roman emperor, right? Centuries ago. And get this, he kept this journal, like his own personal thoughts. We call it meditations now. Yeah, I love meditations. It wasn't meant for anyone else to read though. Really? So meditations gives us this raw personal look into Aurelius trying to find peace. Right. In the middle of ruling ancient Rome. Wow. And you know what? It's kind of relatable even now. Absolutely. What strikes me about meditations is how universal it is. Mm -hmm. Like we might not be emperors, Right. But those things, Aurelia struggled with difficult people, finding meaning, staying balanced. Those are timeless. Totally. And he's honest about the tough stuff. Like one part, he lists what he's grateful for, mm -hmm. super detailed. And it's not just the obvious I'm emperor stuff. Right, right. It gets really personal. That's passage 14. It's a great example of the stoic practice of gratitude. Aurelius didn't just feel grateful. He really thought about the good, no matter how small. Mm. Like. He's grateful his dad steered him away from being a gladiator. Whoa, that's pretty unique. Right. But it shows how important those early influences are. He mentions his teachers a lot too, how they shaped him intellectually and morally. Exactly. Mm. And that dedication to learning, to self-improvement, it's all over meditations. But he doesn't just list things. He thinks about why he's grateful, how they made him who he is. This active gratitude is something Aurelius really promotes as a way to be content even when life is hard it's like he's choosing to focus on the positive even as emperor which with running an empire couldn't have been easy well for sure talk about a stressful job mm -hmm. and speaking of stress i bet aurelius had to deal with some real characters no undoubtedly no yeah. and that takes us to how he dealt with difficult people mm -hmm. still relevant today mm -hmm. passage 15 he talks about people who are idle curious unthankful even crafty envious basically toxic personalities. So how do Roman emperor handle that? What's the ancient wisdom? Banishment. Haha. Uh -huh. Well, he couldn't banish everyone he didn't like. <laughs> Instead, he uses this stoic principle, shared reason. Okay. It's the idea that, yeah, we have different opinions, backgrounds, whatever, but we all have reason and logic. More importantly, we're all part of the human family, mm. connected, mm -hmm. sharing a common fate. So instead of getting caught in the drama or stooping to their level, he sees their flaws as, well, human, like we all have flaws, yeah. rising above it. Exactly. Not excusing bad behavior, but shifting your perspective. It's not, they're out to get me. It's more like they're acting out of their own issues, even if they don't realize it. Doesn't mean accepting this treatment, but it changes how you react inside. That's actually really helpful for those frustrating people we all encounter. It's about choosing compassion, not getting sucked into their negativity. Right. Which takes a lot of self-awareness. It does. It really does. And this whole choosing your reactions thing, focusing on what you can control, that's key for Aurelius. Right. He takes it even further in passage 16. He does this exercise in detachment. Oh, yeah, where he talks about detaching from pretty much everything, our bodies, our emotions, even life itself. Right. Intense stuff. It's powerful. Aurelius is reminding himself and us that so much of what we're attached to, it's temporary. Yeah. Our bodies change eventually back to the earth. Our emotions, as strong as they are, they come and go like waves. Even our time here, it's finite. Makes you think. But how do we actually use this detachment? Are we supposed to walk around thinking about death all the time? It's not about dwelling on death, but seeing that everything changes. Aurelius, being a Stoic, he uses this to focus on what he can control. His thoughts, his actions. He breaks it down, talks about our being having three parts. Okay, the three parts. What are they? How did they connect to this? He says our being is made up of that which we commonly call the mistress and overruling card of man, reason, our life, and our flesh. He says not to get too caught up with the flesh, describing it as blood, bones, and a skin. Our life, he compares to the wind, always changing, not totally up to us. Right. But that ruling part, our reason, that's where we should put our energy, making sure it's not ruled by our baser instincts. So it's like he's saying, don't focus on what you can't control, like getting older, stuff happening outside, other people's opinions. You focus on what you can influence your mind, your choices, how you react. Exactly. And that focusing on what you can control, that's core stoicism and it's powerful. You stop trying to control everything. You focus on being resilient, finding peace. This goes right into passage 17 where Aurelius gets into acceptance. This is accepting what is, right? Yeah. Not just accepting, but like being okay with how things are, even if we don't get it. 
Yeah, and he comes at it from two sides. Divine providence and the natural order. Divine providence in Stoicism, it's not always about a personal God. It's right. more about seeing that the universe has its own plan, even if we don't know what it is. So trusting there's a bigger picture, even if we can't see it all. Right. And with that, accepting the natural order of things. Mm -hmm. Seasons change, day turns to night, life has a rhythm, good and bad. Aurelius says instead of fighting what's inevitable, we find peace by going with that flow. It's humbling, isn't it? We don't need all the answers or control everything to be content. It takes surrender, trusting the process, which, let's be honest, easier said than done. It is humbling. And it makes you think about how we see control, you know, yeah. because it's like the harder we cling to things, the more they slip away. Right, right. Aurelius is suggesting a different way, being okay with things, going with the natural order. Mm -hmm. It's not being passive, but finding that peace inside, even when things don't go right. And that brings us back to focusing on what we can control our reactions. That's the thread through all of this, isn't it? No matter what happens, we choose how we respond. Absolutely. Even in chaos, we can be calm if we choose where our thoughts and energy go. And meditations, it's like a reminder of that choice. It's not rules, it's a guide. Aurelius wants us to think about these ideas, see what fits for us. Because even emperors, they had challenges too. That's actually kind of a relief to remember. Like someone like Aurelius, all that power, all those resources, he still had to deal with the difficult people, searching for meaning, trying to find peace. It's very humanizing, right? Makes you realize yeah. these aren't just like big philosophy ideas. They're real tools for being human, something we share across time. It really is. And reading Aurelius, you realize it's not about being perfect. It's about those moments of grace, of resilience, choosing gratitude, not complaining, what? choosing to understand, not judge choosing to accept instead of fighting. Beautifully put. And that choice, that effort, it stays with us even after this is over. It does. And as we wrap up, here's a question inspired by Aurelius. What if we lived each day like it was our last? Would it change how we spend our time, how we treat each other, how we see our problems? Something to think about. Maybe in asking that, we find more appreciation, more purpose. Maybe we do. This has been a lot to consider. Until next time, may we all, like Marcus Aurelius, try to live each day with purpose, with wisdom, and try to be in the face of adversity. I don't expose, I gotta still resolve. I never retreat, I embrace the struggle, I won't accept defeat. Step up, I keep my head high, never show this bad. Step up, step up. I stay focused on my goals, on my ground, I'm aware. Step up, step up. I persevere through the pain and the strife. Step up, step up, cause I'm a man of strength. I live a slow life. I'm unpredictable, unshakable, yeah. Through the storms, I'm unpredictable, unshakable. I keep my mind steady, my heart cold as steel. I'm unbreakable, unshakable, I know it's wrong. I'm the iron mold, stoic mindset, and my veins is gold. I face the challenges, never lose sight. Stoic manhood, in a stoic fight. Head high, like a pillar of strength in a path of honor. I go to great lengths, pain and strife. I turn it to fuel in the stoic arena where virtues rule. Step up, step up, step up, step up, step up, step up. In. Step up. In the whispers of the wind, stoic echoes ring I'm the architect of my fate, I build my own way I stand tall, unyielding like a stone Stoic principles in every verse I've known Rolls in my focus in the grind, I'm aware In the face of challenge, I declare Through pain and strife, I navigate A stoic man in the world I cultivate I wear my scars like badges of pride Yeah, In the stoic rhythm, I let the beat guide Never show despair, never taking a dive in the stoic anthem, I thrive I'm unbreakable, unshakable yeah. Through the storms, I'm unbreakable, unshakable I keep my mind steady, my heart cold as steel I'm unbreakable, unshakable For a concept, it can never be satisfied to going back to where it was So some of you are going to experience a breakthrough Some of you are going to go back and look at your dreams and brush them off Some of you are going to begin to look at yourself and say Hey, look here, I know I have not done all that I can do When Buster Douglas was fighting with Mike Tyson And the odd makers predicted he was a bum and be out He'd be knocked out in about one or two rounds I think that after he made it to the third round He took some of Mike Tyson's best shots He said, wait, wait a minute Hey, Mike, you know it's possible that maybe this next call might do.
It's possible this next job interview might be the one. It's possible. In spite of 27 rejections, it's possible that this might be the one. It's possible. Just maybe I can do this. That's, that's all. That, that puts you on the playing field. You ain't got to hype yourself and psych yourself out. What it does is just keep you moving in that direction. That's all I'm asking you. Believe that it's possible that you can make it. I like what Charles Allen said. He said, when you say a situation, a person is hopeless, you're slamming the door in the face of God. You're slamming the door in the face of God. There's no guarantee that because somebody is now down on their luck, they can never come back. Who can guarantee that you can't make it? That you can't have your dream? Who can guarantee that you can't do what you want to do? No one can do that. No one can predict that. You can't even do that. You don't know what the possibilities are for your life. No, no, no. All we need to do is we look at our dreams. As we get ready to hit the floor, I'm blessed and highly favored. And it's possible I can get my dream. You go after that dream too. Don't go casually. You got to go out there like you want that dream. Don't, don't go out here like these people. See, when you feel like you're blessed, you're ready to get into a good fight for this dream. You're ready to get down for this dream. You want your dream? Then you say, I want this dream if it's convenient, if I don't have any hassle, if I don't have to flip through any hoops. Give a person everything that he desires, and at the same moment, he will feel that this is not everything. The only constant in life is change. Embrace it, and you'll grow. I am a firm believer in the people. If given the truth, they can be depended upon to meet any national crisis. The great point is to bring them the real facts. Abraham Lincoln At 20 years of age, the will reigns, at 30, the wit, and at 40, the judgment. Being human means having doubts and yet still continuing on your path. Success in life is the result of good judgment. Good judgment is usually the result of experience. Experience is usually the result of bad judgment. Brian Tracy Against those who lament over being pitied I am grieved, a man says, at being pitied Whether then is the fact of your being pitied a thing which concerns you or those who pity you? Well, is it in your power to stop this pity? It is in my power if I show them that I do not require pity. And whether then are you in the condition of not deserving pity, or are you not in that condition? I think I am not. But these persons do not pity me for the things for which if they ought to pity me it would be proper, I mean, for my faults. But they pity me for my poverty, for not possessing honorable offices, for diseases and deaths, and other such things. Whether then are you prepared to convince the many that not one of these things is an evil, but that it is possible for a man who is poor and has no office and enjoys no honor to be happy, or to show yourself to them as rich and in power? For the second of these things belong to a man who is boastful, silly, and good for nothing, and consider by what means the pretense must be supported. It will be necessary for you to hire slaves and to possess a few silver vessels, and to exhibit them in public if it is possible, though they are often the same, and to attempt to conceal the fact that they are the same, and to have splendid garments, and all other things for display, and to show that you are a man honored by the great, and to try to sup at their houses, or to be supposed to sup there, and as to your person to employ some mean arts, that you may appear to be more handsome and nobler than you are. These things you must contrive if you choose to go by the second path in order not to be pitied. But the first way is both impracticable and long, to attempt the very thing which Zeus has not been able to do, to convince all men what things are good and bad, 
Is this power given to you? This only is given to you to convince yourself and you have not convinced yourself. Then I ask you, do you attempt to persuade other men and who has lived so long with you as you with yourself and who has so much power of convincing you as you have of convincing yourself and who is better disposed and nearer to you than you are to yourself? How then have you not convinced yourself in order to learn? At present are not things upside down? Is this what you have been earnest about doing? To learn to be free from grief and free from disturbance and not to be humbled and to be free? Have you not heard then that there is only one way which leads to this end, to give up the things which do not depend on the will, to withdraw from them? and to admit that they belong to others. For another man then to have an opinion about you, of what kind is it? It is a thing independent of the will. Then is it nothing to you? It is nothing. When then you are still vexed at this and disturbed, do you think that you are convinced about good and evil? Will you not then, letting others alone, be to yourself both scholar and teacher? The rest of mankind will look after this, whether it is to their interest to be and to pass their lives in a state contrary to nature. But to me no man is nearer than myself. What then is the meaning of this, that I have listened to the words of the philosophers and I assent to them, but in fact I am no way made easier? Am I so stupid? And yet, in all other things such as I have chosen, I have not been found very stupid. But I learned letters quickly, and to wrestle, and geometry, and to resolve syllogisms. Has not then reason convinced me? And indeed no other things have I from the beginning so approved and chosen. And now I read about these things, hear about them, write about them. I have so far discovered no reason stronger than this. In what then am I deficient? Have the contrary opinions not been eradicated from me? Have the notions themselves not been exercised nor used to be applied to action, but as armor are laid aside and rusted and cannot fit me? And yet neither in the exercises of the palaestra, nor in writing or reading am I satisfied with learning. But I turn up and down the syllogisms which are proposed, and I make others, and sophistical syllogisms also, but the necessary theorems, by proceeding from which a man can become free from grief, fear, passions, hindrance, and a free man, these I do not exercise myself in, nor do I practice in these the proper practice. Then I care about what others will say of me, whether I shall appear to them worth notice, whether I shall appear happy. Wretched man, will you not see what you are saying about yourself? What do you appear to yourself to be? In your opinions, in your desires, in your aversions from things, in your movements, in your preparation, in your designs and in other acts suitable to a man. But do you trouble yourself about this, whether others pity you? Yes, but I am pitied not as I ought to be. Are you then pained at this? And is he who is pained an object of pity? Yes. How then are you pitied not as you ought to be? Everybody wants the future, but nobody wants to accept their current reality. See, truth is not what you want it to be. It is what it is, and you must bend to its power or live a lie. See, so many people keep telling themselves it didn't happen, but it did, and it hurts you.